the recording. Thank you very much. So uh, I will uh, offer the floor to Maria Todorova to uh, present us uh, with uh, her initial thoughts on what inspired her to write this book. Thank you. Thank you, Theodora. Uh, and I have to begin with my really, really sincere and heartfelt gratitude for, for, for this uh, possibility. It is, in fact, the first proper discussion of this uh, book, apart from the formal presentations that I've made and uh, which are on YouTube and everyone can, uh, can look at them. So a serious discussion, of, of course, is uh, always uh, shows how unfinished a book is. Uh, and uh, I think of it as a creative space of supplemental writing. And I am so much looking forward uh, to, uh, to listen how you have read the book, uh, which threads you have picked up, uh, which analysis you find frustrat frustrating or uh, underdeveloped. And, hopefully some also uh, inspiring. Uh, and in the end, I hope it will come out as a richer work. Uh, I've been reading uh, lately a wonderful book uh, in which uh, Michel de Montaigne has been uh, cited by saying that uh, the study of books is a languishing and feeble motion which does not keep you hot. Uh, whereas, uh, conversation or conference, as he calls it, uh, teaches us uh, and exercises us really uh, and uh, at once. And so I, I hope that we will have this conference at once. So as Theodora suggested, uh, I will be very brief. I have these five minutes and I would like to do two things uh, to tell you how I see the book now when it is uh, finished and then to tell you how I began, uh, why I began uh, writing it. So today I see it broadly as an emancipatory project. What does it emancipate? Firstly, it problematizes uh, generalized ideological descriptions that rely on silencing the liminal. Uh, the liminal or the marginal is not uh, erected here as a radical alternative uh, to, <clears throat> uh, to displace the dominant paradigm, nor is it erected uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, simply something to add or to enrich this dominant paradigm. But I want to show that it has constitutive power and to alert to the losses we incur by dismissing the periphery uh, and, uh, uh, and the erasure of possible uh, all the alternatives. Secondly, I hope that, eman uh, that it emancipates different historical approaches uh, away from the usual binary uh, the dismissal of previous ones. Uh, you all know that we have uh, hopped from narrative uh, history, which was unseated, uh, then we embraced social and quantitative history, then dismissing the previous one. Uh, then uh, <clears throat> we dismissed the, uh, the, the number crunching uh, and uh, we embraced the linguistic turn. And then we are back to the body, to in the environment and to big and global history, uh, which, which looks down on petty descriptions, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, So uh, I hope to have shown that different scales of analysis require different methods and are based on different sources. And that the different scales of observation and the different ways we approach these scales are all legitimate. Thirdly, and this follows from the second, uh, and I, uh, I think of it uh, as uh, unintendedly, I think I'm emancipating the nationally based approach, which is not necessarily uh, inimical to comparative history. And I know that Ulf is next week on a panel about comparative history. Uh, it has been a mantra, of course, uh, that comparative history should uh, compare uh, as much as possible uh, as much as possible, uh, you know, uh, uh, equivalently two or better, more, um, or more comparable uh, cases in order to overcome methodological nationalism. Uh, but one, uh, but uh, of course, uh, this has come with very few exceptions uh, uh, at the cost of asymmetrical analysis and uh, at the cost of thick dis description. And I think that uh, one can put the national in a web of, uh, of broader connections and not sacrifice the specific. Fourthly, uh, I, th uh, I, I think that the top-down examination of interpolation to the individual 
is being reversed in this book uh, in favor of individual close-ups. And this is what I want to uh, emancipate again, uh, emphasizing the thought emotion and thought slash emotion, because I, I believe it is the same thing uh, that shapes uh, individual agency. Uh, so this grounding in individuals in the scale of the particular essentially produces a historical ethnography from the uh, archive. Uh, and uh, I believe it's a methodology which, which uh, you know, gives us a constant reminder against uh, the inferences and then also uh, terminological uh, slippage. And fifth, and, and most obvious, and it, it, I, I should have started with, with, with this, it emancipates the people who uh, believed that they were socialists, men and women and uh, everybody else. And uh, it emancipates, and I, I'm trying to recuperate the appeal of socialist ideology and the, uh, and the utopia implicit in it. So this is how I see the book today. Uh, but, but this is not uh, uh, how I began uh, writing the book. Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, I did not have a project when I started writing it. I did not have a hypothesis. I did not have a methodological instrumentarium. Uh, all the, des the, the desiderata that we are imposing on our graduate students before, the, before we let them go to the archives to search uh, for their sources. And I understand why, but I've always had difficulty with this, uh, with this approach. So I myself was sitting in the Sophia archives and working on something completely different. I was putting the last touches on, uh, on the Levski book and leading this uh, uh, you know, remembering communism project. But I stumbled upon a cache of documentation uh, from the archives of the Communist Party, which was closed, and, uh, and the archives have been uh, given to the state archives. And this collection of over 4,000 documentary sources was classified as, as memoirs, encompass, uh, encompassing uh, really different genres. Uh, so uh, some are memoirs par excellence, um, uh, some, uh, some of them published very few of them were published. Most were critical and would have uh, this uh, uh, red uh, red pencil on top of it saying secret or not for uh, for use on the files cover. Others were uh, handwritten uh, diaries never used in research. Uh, the first dating from the beginning of the uh, of the. Uh, 20th century and still others were uh, intimate correspondence back from the uh, 1860s and 70s. So the history of the gathering of this archive is itself a fascinating story, uh, which uh, uh, ranging from donations to, uh, uh, to uh, acquisitions or, or even to commissioned pieces. So uh, uh, this enormously rich source had never been tapped and for all practical purposes was neglected and considered to be trash. So I was picking up this trash and I found it fascinating and just to read it. Uh, and uh, it was the sources that seduced me in trying to find a shape for them. So, so then the issue was, the, uh, was how to frame them and the rest is history. I'm going up to, to the first. Uh, so one additional thing is that I always was aware of different publics, the local one, you know, my Bulgarian public to which I wanted to communicate something it did not know uh, and the broader one, which is very sophisticated, sophisticated in framing, but knows close to nothing of the specifics. And I have to admit, uh, it was a very difficult thing to balance. So that's it. Thank you, Maria. So we will um, go in the order we agreed. Ulf, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Theodora, for inviting me. Uh, to, to be on this panel, although it's a bit an intimate task to to comment on such a wonderful uh, book, I could uh, I could keep it very very brief because everything that uh, that Maria said about uh, what she wanted to achieve or wants to achieve with the book is uh, true. So uh, you need to read it, but uh, I think it's generally one of these books, and there are not so many, which show why. Uh, we need to study Eastern and Southeast European uh, history. And uh, it would be great if some of uh, the colleagues of, of our colleagues from so-called European or general history would um, also read uh, such, a, uh, such a book when talking also about the 
heuristic productivity of liminality and and uh, and marginality. So this is a really extremely rich uh, book. It's a, a book full with captivating tales of individuals who wanted to make the world a better place. Uh, Maria quite unapologetically uses the word demonica heroes for her protagonist, and I think it's the right it's the right one. Uh, many of them actually gave the ultimate sacrifice for a better world. Half of the around 3,500 individuals that were entered in the database, which forms the basis of the prosopography, um, uh, were killed in uh, mainly between 1923 and 1925. We also learned so there are so many things that you can uh, you can learn that uh, and uh, probably the second most frequent reason why protagonists of this story uh, died a premature death was tuberculosis, which um, in a way I found from uh, the point of view of today interesting because it was obviously a pandemic that affected the poor and workers in particular, which obviously was a lesson the world did not really learn. But back to the heroes. So any, any reader will probably pick uh, her or his uh, individual uh, uh, most 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 cherished individual mine was uh, a certain Dimitar Pandev, Pandov, uh, born to a poor stone cutter family in a small town in the Rodopi Mountains. As, as you might know, I did some research about the Rodopi Mountains, so this was obvious my uh, my pick. Uh, a young guy who learned from socialism. Uh, about socialism from his father. And uh, since none of his friends had ever heard of socialism, this became a matter of pride for him. He also developed uh, an urge, a great desire for education. So he decided to go to high school to Plovdiv. He went barefoot more than 30 kilometers from his native village to Plovdiv. Uh, he carried his uh, shoes, which he wanted to pre preserve for the winter. He also carried a ribbon uh, on which he had written proletarians of the world unite in Bulgarian, obviously. And the Plovdiv he even met the Bulgarian exarch of the time with whom he conversed about Marx, Engels, and from uh, whom he also got some money, which he used to buy uh, pastry for his socialist colleagues. So this is the kind of stories that, uh, that you find in the book, which in other parts is, uh, is a social history of the first two generations of socialists in Bulgaria, 3,500 people. You can imagine how much work it takes to enter these uh, lives into a database. Um, so my first, my first kind of question or comment, I think I have four questions or comments slash comments, uh, would concern the relationship between socialism and individual life projects. So, because I think one, one thing that the book uh, impressively does is to show that it is not only individuals that uh, matter for socialism, but also socialism that matters for individuals of very different backgrounds. So we read uh, about multiple pathways into socialism and also pathways out of socialism. Ideological outlooks were malleable, life trajectories dynamic, volatile, and unpredictable as well. So in a way, uh, can, we, can we actually say that to which extent uh, was socialism not only a collective utopia, to which the title of the book also uh, alludes, but also an individual biographic project, which gave a sense of meaning and underpinned personal strategies for subjectivization. Um, can we also use maybe a, a, a fin de circle language of, uh, of psychological or ontological insecurities of fears driving this uh, uh, driving identification with uh, socialism with an idea that gave stability to lives at the time of profound social change. Um, a second, a second uh, a set of questions cons concerns the prosopography, which I really found one uh, probably not very surprising to Maria as a social historian. I also do believe in the power of numbers. Uh, and uh, generally, I mean, it's really fascinating to, to read a book which uh, on the one hand articulates far reaching conceptual ideas, which uh, uh, theorizes uh, its uh, approaches and uh, methods to the degree which uh, only Maria can, but at the same time is so empirical. 
historical. Uh, so it's also a very important and excellent piece of social, of social history. And good luck to any, to any ill-minded reviewer who wants to find factual uh, mistakes. So that's going to be, to be a challenge. It also shows that the socialism and facts do align pretty well, actually. But what it transpires for me from the posopography that uh, that uh, an, a, a sort of a macro sociological approach which would try to predict the ideological orientation of individuals on the basis of certain structural factors given is not really feasible. Uh, it seems to me that contingent events, accidental encounters, and most important of all, deliberate practices seem to be much more important for making a socialist a socialist than social structures. Obviously, we find many teachers among the socialists, but probably there were even uh, many more teachers who were not socialists. socialists. But one, one thing seems to uh, connect many of these lives, which is the extremely high degree of mobility domestic for some, international for many others. So is this maybe one, in a way, it's not a social structure, obviously, mobility, but if uh, an outcome of certain structures, can, can we connect uh, mobility with a certain degree of likelihood to end up as a socialist? Um, the, the third question concerns the role of emotions, which is one of the very strong sides of, of, uh, of the book because it shows how closely related emotions and ideolo ideological identifications can, can uh, be. So emotions and the socialist project, they are closely uh, connected. We read about love, we read about romantics, we read about uh, dignity. Uh, by the way, we don't read a lot about dark emotions, uh, so there's not much about frustrations and, uh, and uh, maybe even hatred uh, or fears. Uh, so maybe you can say a little bit how these kind of emotions relate to, to socialism. But my question is another one. Um, you have a very convincing idea of the generation unit, as you call it, and following Mannerheim mainly, it's generation unit as a kind of an imagined community, which I found really very, very convincing. But uh, I'm not so sure whether you consider emotion also as something that builds uh, collectivity that creates uh, community because uh, it seems that uh, you talk about emotion mainly with regard to individual uh, biographies and these and these uh, uh, lives. But can we conceive socialists also as an affective community that uh, shared certain sentiments, uh, which were transformed into the emotional clue of solidarity? So, can we speak? Can we anyway collectivize uh, emotions? And the last question, if I may, uh, uh, concerns uh, one of your methodological observations. In, in the first chapter, you articulate a certain uneasiness with the concept of transfer and uh, also some other monikers from transnational history with which I would uh, fully agree. And I can add actually another problem uh, which comes with this idea of transfer, which was observed by Lara Putnam, who wrote that uh, transfer over overemphasizes the importance of that which connects while underestimating the weight of that which is connected, like social structures. And your book is so much about the importance of place and and uh, and location. At some other point, you seem to consider Histoire Croiset as a productive framework for your analysis, but doesn't it come with a similar problems of uh, ultimately being predicated on the idea of uh, comparing national units in a much more sophisticated way than, way than comparative history? This, because what transpired, what, at least in my reading, the story that you showed was one of uh, socialism being, and to use another it's probably a word coming from, uh, from public relations, but it's, it's co-created. So we are reading about the co-production of, of uh, something in a polycentric network uh, in which the configurations between nodal points and the marginal places constantly, constantly change. So maybe co-creation could, uh, could be a terminology that uh, avoids the pitfalls of transfers. And finally, I think it's very difficult to read such a book uh, without, first of all, thinking about counterfactuals, uh, but also without uh, relating it to our present day condition at the time when social democracy in much of Europe seems to be in terminal decline in Bulgaria, um, uh, for sure, uh, as well. 
so what 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 could we learn from your Bulgarian uh, socials? I think one thing that uh, that uh, that we can learn is uh, never to underestimate the power of the urge uh, of people of people and peoples uh, to be the subject, not the object of history. It seems to generate a lot of political imagination and creativity. For example, in ways, in uh, intelligent ways, actually, how, or at least in posing the question, how uh, national or ethnic self-affirmation can be aligned with internationalism, something for which the left today does not have, have a very good answer. Uh, Karl Polanyi uh, reminds us that uh, if this urge for uh, 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 for being the subject of history is uh, ignored too blatantly, counter movements will emerge. So can, uh, can, uh, can your Bulgarian, most of them unsung heroes, some of them sung heroes, can your Bulgarian socialists uh, tell us something about how we can uh, take, uh, take uh, this nice idea of to take control back uh, away from right wing populists who nowadays seem to have a monopoly on these claims. Thank you. Thank you, Wolf. Uh, we'll go with Kristen next. All right, I'm unmuted now, hopefully. Uh, I want to say also thank you to uh, Maria and Theodora for inviting me. And um, I'm just going to launch in. So for the purposes of keeping to the time. Um, it was really a pleasure to, to read this book. And um, it I had initially intended really to specifically talk about the role of women's lives and the kind of recuperation of women's stories and the methodological challenges of doing that. But as I am an ethnographer and not a historian, I believe I'm the only non-historian here, um, as I was finishing the book and really kind of preparing my thoughts and comments on women, I found myself completely overwhelmed really by this word utopia and really thinking about utopia. And so I decided to kind of go on a, on a slightly different direction. And um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. All right. So in her chapter on Angelina Bonova, Todorova introduces us to the idea of the extraordinary ordinary person someone whose life is not representative of some statistical average or of a particular subgroup of some clan of acknowledged historical significance, but a fully autonomous individual whose life and work deserves to be remembered on its own terms as a legacy of one particular mind in one particular moment in time. As an ethnographer, this question of significance forever haunts my discipline especially in an era of big data where everyone is keen to understand some imagined concept of public opinion or popular preferences in order to manipulate, deceive, subvert, or most likely market to it. When the citizens of every continent are micro-blogging the daily minutia of their lives on platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or most recently TikTok, those harvesting this content see its value only in its aggregation and monetization. But the discipline of cultural anthropology demands that we take individuals and small communities as representatives of something deeper, always looking for clues to the universality of human experience despite the many differences that divide us. In her chapter on Todor Tsekov, Todorova tells us that his handwritten memoir diary of over 1,100 pages only constituted the first four volumes of a 10 volume set. Todorova reflects, quote, excluding novelists and a few politicians, I have never encountered such graphomania in anyone, unquote. Her mention of the word graphomania reminded me of one of my favorite passages of Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting when he meets a graphomaniacal taxi driver. Kandera writes, quote, graphomania is not a desire to write letters, personal diaries, or family chronicles, to write for oneself or one's close relations, but a desire to write books, to have a public of unknown readers. For everyone is pained by the thought of disappearing, unheard and unseen, into an indifferent universe. And because of that, everyone wants, while there is still time, to turn himself into a universe of words, unquote. 
The many rich lives that Todorova rescues from, the oblivion, from oblivion in her book, extraordinary, ordinary people like Angelina Bonova, Todor and Katya Tsekov, Koika Tinova and Nikola Sakharov, Sakharov, as well as the many glimpses of socialist women and wives, allow us to find the universality in the specificity of these lives, their overwhelming desire to build a better world their imagining of a utopia, and in this case, very specifically, a socialist one. Every daring attempt to make a great change in existing conditions, every lofty vision of new possibilities for a human race has been labeled utopian, explained Emma Goldman in 1911. The German sociologist Karl Mannheim also argued that utopia was a necessary antidote to ideology, which he defined as the unseen but omnipresent social, cultural, and philosophical structures of ideas that uphold, uphold a particular order of things, protecting those who hold political and economic power. Quote, inasmuch as man is a creature living primarily in history and society, Mannheim wrote in 1929, the existence that surrounds him is never existence as such, but always a concrete historical form of social existence. The representatives of a given order will label as utopian all conceptions of existence, which from their point of view can in principle never be realized." Unquote. In other words, those who benefit from the status quo have a strong motive for labeling as utopian any ideas which threaten it. But even beyond that, those steeped in the ideology of their current existence quite literally cannot imagine an alternative to it. And most people just follow along. But Todorova's beautiful book shows us that there have always been dreamers like these socialists, these lost socialists on Europe's margins, refusing to accept the status quo, fighting for women's rights, for improvements in the lives of peasants and workers, for worlds free from exploitation and misery, and for more democratic forms of political participation. Their dreams may have had different contours, and we know very well that there are always conflicts among people with different visions of the ideal future, and she does a very good job of talking about these conflicts. But we also know from history that it is these dreamers that ultimately move our societies forward. Behind the great men and women, but usually men, who are written about in our history books, there are billions of extraordinary, ordinary men and women who have devoted their lives for causes bigger than themselves alone. And these causes gave purpose and meaning to their lives, helped order and structure their days, and allowed them to feel, even if only briefly, that they might not disappear unheard and unseen into an indifferent universe. In his 1863 novel, What is to be Done, Chernyshevsky outlined a utopian vision of the future where workers would finally enjoy the fruits of their own labor in his protagonist Vera Pavlovna's third dream sequence. Quote, tell everyone that the future will be radiant and beautiful, Chernyshevsky writes, love it, strive toward it, work for it, bring it nearer, transfer into the present as much as you can from it." Unquote. It is not easy to imagine a better future, a utopia out there floating on the horizon when the crushing, crushing burdens of quotidian existence often limit our ability to dream. Tired and apathetic, most of us cling carelessly to the status quo, convinced by our societies that any attempt to change this will, in, will inevitably devolve into dystopia. By salvaging these moving lost life stories from Europe's margins, Todorova has shown us the value and importance of social dreaming in an era when utopianism is still derided as useless at best and politically dangerous at worst. I think Todorova's book shows us that the uncanny ability to believe in an unknown but somehow better future, to see the world not as it is, but as it should be, is what makes these individuals extraordinary in their ordinariness. And for me, this is ultimately a book of what um, Todorova just called individual close-ups of hope, 
of the tenacity of the human spirit to think beyond the suffocating ideological boxes of the present. And I'll end with a quote from Oscar Wilde. A map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country sets sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. And I think Maria's book really does a wonderful job in helping us to remember what an important thing it is to have some kind of utopian vision in our lives. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Kristen. And I think we are now, uh, next comes uh, Larry, Larry Wolf, thank you. Thank you, Theodora. This is really wonderful to um, be gathered here to discuss and to celebrate Maria's book. Maria, I wanna congratulate you. It's such a beautiful book. I was very moved by it. We've talked about it over a while now. It's such a, a remarkable project. Um, you and I have been talking about projects together now for quite a long time over the last three decades. Um, I would say we've conspired together <laughs> over the last three decades and um, often around issues of East and West and thinking about Europe. And one of the things that I found you know, most moving about the book was the way that you take us to Europe's margins, as you call it in the book, and seek to bring out of it a, a, a more complete history of Europe, a full and honest history of Europe. There is one point in the book where you speak about um, early 20th century Bulgaria being even beyond Ruritania. And um, so far beyond Ruritania that early 20th century Bulgaria, I know actually takes you to Illinois, to Madison, Illinois at one point. So a reminder that Ruritania has very broad boundaries. You and I have spent a lot of time in Ruritania together over the years. And um, listening to Kristen, I began to wonder whether perhaps Ruritania is utopia, the one country where we are always landing, as Wilde suggested. Um, let me come back to the complete history of Europe, the idea of a socialism that we really don't understand unless we understand what it looks like and feels like in its Bulgarian context. I love what you said about this as being an um, emancipatory project um, for, um, thinking about socialism in relation to individuals who, as Kristen suggests, these extraordinary, ordinary people who are emancipated here into the, into the world of history um, in which you give them to us. Um, love that you've set this up as a presopography, and not just of individuals, but of individual human feeling as expressed even in the case of, in the instance of graphomania, in which um, shows us how powerful um, individual human feeling can be. I wanna say that over the three decades that you and I have been talking to each other about history, I don't think if I went back to the 1990s, I would have predicted that you and I might both take an emotional turn at some point down the road. Was very moved by that emotional turn. You know, it's been of interest to me in my work as well in recent years, maybe especially in relation to writing about music. But um, you've done something really, you know, quite precise here. Um, because, it, because of the presopography, we have a sense of the history of sentiments, the structures of feeling, as you call them, and the ways in which they um, actually become the medium in which um, political and social ideas become, become meaningful for people. Love the postcard that you start with, the postcard from 1911 sent from one 14-year-old girl to another with the beautiful picture of Liberty on the cover and the little um, bubble pictures of Marx and Babel and La Salle. Um, 
And um, of course, I love that one of those 14 year old girls is your grandmother and that the lost world that you've put together here is in fact the lost world of your grandmother and the lost world of all of our grandmothers, those of us who are of a certain generation. My grandmothers were also were 14 before, before World War I. Um, and um, it's a world that belongs to us in a certain sense. It's part of our family history. And the, to think about the ways in which um, it's produced in the context of utopian socialism um, and the ways in which that utopian socialism constitutes and well, I mean, what Ulf referred to as an effective community, right? The diary gives us less of a sense of, commu of community, but the postcard gives us community right away. It's a way in which two people communicate with each other and around a certain kind of very powerful imagery. Um, when I was an undergraduate history student in the 1970s, um, the world of the Second International did not seem so far away. Um, it was maybe 60 years out of date. People who were of the generation of my grandparents remembered that world. And certainly the world of the early Third International was very vivid to um, professors of mine when I was a student. And one of the things that I found, again, I hope you'll allow me to say moving about your book, right? It's, since it's a book about the emotions, I tell you honestly, I was moved by it, is the sense in which both the Second International and the Early Third International have become much more remote to us today. I'm very interested in the sense of Einsteinian history that one takes away from this book. That is to say that we are constantly in motion, moving away from a history that we can sometimes recapture even better for being further from it as it moves away from us in relative time. I was thinking back to this moment. Again, it was when I was a college student reading about the world of the second international and um, realizing that what was referred to as the communist international was not just the organization, but sometimes referred to a song. And then realizing that um, I had never heard that song because how would I have heard that song in cold, in, you know, growing up as a kid in Cold War America? And of course, there was no YouTube. And I actually had to do a little bit of research to find the sheet, some sheet music for the Communist International to have a sense of what the Second International sounded like and, um, and the sense of what that effective community might have been like if one imagined people singing it together as one moves towards the swelling refrain. Um, Second International, as I learned it when I was a student, a little like the Third International, um, was a kind of tragic narrative. That is to say, Second International ended with the assassination of Jerez on July 31st, um, 1914, and with the German Social Democrats voting for war credits unanimously on August 4th, 1914. And it was a um, a, a, a narrative that had an ending and a bad ending. That is to say, the narrative of utopian socialism was a narrative of disappointment. I don't need to tell you that the narrative of the Third International was even more a narrative of disappointment and tragic ending than the narrative of the, than the, of the Second International. And one of the things I really like about the book is the way that um, Socialism is lived and experienced here without the imposition of a um, teleo teleological narrative that um, tells us exactly where it's going or provides a moral judgment upon the direction in which it's moving. But the focus um, very beautifully is on the way that history is experienced. 
Um, so last point that I want to make um, is about the ways in which utopianism, I thought Kristen spoke about it really beautifully just now, um, the ways in which it's a forward-looking emotional experience of politics, which looks to the future. Here, paradoxically, as I said, we're recovering a utopianism, which is moving farther away from us backwards in time, as it attempts to reach forward into our own time by projecting um, what is its own counterfactual future, because it's not actually the future that we're living at the moment, the future that our socialist grandmothers might have imagined. Um, I like what Ulf said about thinking about it as an antidote to fin de siècle insecurity. And um, if I were going back to this um, and we had more time to think about it, I'd be interested in how it connects to the world of the 90s and how it then connects to the idea of the beginning of a new century, whether that's part of what our grandmothers are trying to unpack along with their um, utopian sentiments. But here what I want to set alongside of the um, forward looking future orientation of utopianism is our strange sense of backward looking nostalgia, which is part of our emotional experience of history. As Kristen says, there have always been dreamers, but it's important to us to believe and to know that there have always been dreamers. It's you know powerful and reinforcing for us to know that. And um, one of the things that I kept thinking about reading about this book is that there's a point here in which our backward looking historical retrospection tinged with emotional nostalgia intersects with their forward looking utopianism, no less emotionally tinged. And that there's um, the basis here for reflecting on a kind of phenomenology of the emotions in history and the ways in which the medium of human feeling actually connects us to the history historical, to the historical past. That is to say, our feelings connecting with their feelings, um, helping us along with you, Maria, to recover the lost world of Bulgarian socialism through a diary, through a postcard, through human experience, through the structure of feelings as the basis for understanding the ways in which human beings like our grandparents related to social and political ideas. Thank you for writing such a beautiful book. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Um, so I, I will try to offer also some brief remarks at the end, and I probably should have gone earlier. Uh, but let me let me um, give it a try. So what I really wanted to do um, in my uh, ten minutes is actually give you a taste of uh, Maria's writing, give you a taste of classic uh, Todorova. Uh, and her multiscopic approach, the, what she calls it, this approach that combines the material, social, and emotional infrastructure to recover the lost world of socialists at Europe's margins. So I will start with an example from the first part of the book, Centers and Peripheries, in which Maria literally turns centers and peripheries on their head. And also she urges us very strongly to uh, pay attention on the vocabulary that we use as we are describing uh, socialism and especially the history of early socialism. She alerts us only on uh, that the history of socialism very often has been described using the vocabulary of uh, influences, appropriations, the diffusion of idea, and instead, she offers an alternative language of formations, which uh, she hopes will help us study processes in transformation and the intersections or intercrossing of ideas where both sides remain active and they are not necessarily experiencing the diffusion of ideas from, well, one side to another. And we all know that in the mainstream literature, the direction of this diffusion tends to be from west to east. So I will give you one excerpt from page 33 here. I can all, almost uh, hear uh, Maria Chico here. 
True, Capital was first translated into Bulgarian from Russian in two separate translations in 1909 and 1910. But does Marx translated from Russian become less Marxist and more Russian? Especially keeping in mind that the first translation of Capital in any European language was in Russian. And she continues, Bulgarian socialists took the work of translating their Bible seriously and executed it meticulously. With Marx, socialists were reading in original or in translation a German text written in London by a cosmopolitan atheist who also happened to come from a converted Jewish background and had strong opinions on the Jewish question, so much so that he is not even claimed as a part of the Jewish pantheon. Why is this East-West transfer or transmission? One never speaks of the transfer of Marxism in France, nor in England, even in the German context, and I'm skipping a little bit here, Marxism and Marx had to be transmitted and imposed. It also had to be translated from German into German in a more accessible language. So as you can clearly see here, she is challenging, challenging, challenging us uh, here right from the start to consider our scholarly vocabulary and to be very careful with the language that we use. Later on in this chapter, which does a lot by providing also context, she examines the relationship between nationalism and socialism and shows the rather parochial attitude of a number of great Western socialists, contemporaries, and later influential writers, including her hero, Eric Hobsbawm. With all of these examples, what all of these examples show is the value of a multidimensional approach that acknowledges plurality and complex configurations and does not assume centers and peripheries. Instead, Todorova challenges premises of historical significance which presuppose value orientation and insists on the transformative function of salvaging peripheral visions and demonstrating the value of local subaltern perspectives. This she speaks about the formation rather than the, rather than the transfer or diffusion of ideas. But this is not all. This history from above analysis ends with a beautiful example from below that gives us a good idea of what is to follow in the book. So fast forward to 1917, and in the middle of the Great War, Bulgarian socialist Georgi Kirchhoff sends a basket with 100 eggs and some things to eat to Karl Kautsky, the Red Baron, uh, the Red Pope and keeper of Marxist or, or uh, orthodoxy. Uh, Kautsky had first tacitly supported the position of the German government in the Great War, but by 1917, he had denounced the annexation uh, aims of Germany. And this is what uh, Kirchhoff wrote to Kautsky, uh, and I can imagine the delight uh, of finding this excerpt in the archives. I'm happy that I could contribute through my modest gift to the material basis of your world of ideas especially now when the international proletariat brought to confusion by the events betrayed and almost without leadership needs urgently the bold, committed and above all consistent word of its own trusted and faithful master and leader. Now tell me where is the center and where is the periphery in this exchange between Kirchhoff and uh, Kautsky. Uh, and now tell me, are, uh, I mean, where are socialist ideas diffused from and who are they appropriated by? Now, a question I have for Maria in this part, um, both uh, in the center and peripheries and uh, pros prosopographies. While I was reading this part of the book, I kept thinking that this story of Bulgarian socialists studying abroad, traveling to international congresses, corresponding with other European socialists and reading, discussing, or translating socialist literature is wonderfully suited for historical analysis centered on transnational networks and particularly the circulation of ideas between emigre circles. So I realized that this part of the book already does a lot, but I wonder if this was not something appealing uh, as a line of analysis and uh, if not, why? Uh, I was also going to give another example from uh, actually the third part of the book, which focuses on structures of feelings and ego narratives. And particularly, I had chosen to speak a little bit about Angelina Bonaparte because Kristen 
uh, already spoke about her a little bit, I uh, might uh, just skip this, but urge you all to actually read these wonderful stories and assign one of them to your students. And uh, really, I believe that you are going to get a great reaction and a great discussion because they provide a fertile ground for many discussions uh, of uh, positionality uh, and uh, the importance of emotions uh, and uh, the, the affective turn. But what really struck me here is the masterful research that was executed. How do we know about Angelina and what do we know about Angelina Bonova, a teacher, a patriot, a socialist who lived until uh, age 86 when she was forcefully retired from her position as a teacher uh, in a remote village, to the writing of her students and colleagues who considered her uh, a transform transformative figure, to the official school book which she kept and which included plentiful snarky commentaries and also the remarks and redactions of superintendents due to the inappropriateness of the writing of Bonneva as they saw it and also through five notebooks of her unfinished memoirs which are notes for an unfinished autobiography. Now there are many fascinating details in these ego documents, but what Maria shows us is that below the surface of a fierce patriot and devoted socialist, there was childhood trauma and Bonneva used her writings as a psychotherapeutic confessional whose purpose was to create a narrative identity for the author to better understand herself and her life choices and life trajectory. It really is a powerful analysis. So to return here to the issue of historical significance that also Kristen raised, are these typical people? Do they need to be? And as Todorova emphatically notes, it does not matter if these are representative people. In the same way, it does not matter if Bulgaria is a representative country to study early socialism. What matters is the polyphony of voices we're able to hear if we cared to read about these historical actors. Because ultimately, this narrative demonstrates the synchronous existence of multiple socialisms and Marxisms and the full rich embrace of utopia that people who sought a way to build that utopia in their own lives. So Maria ends the book with a very short coda, which I had uh, wished to actually see a little bit expanded. And in her coda, she fondly speaks, and I would say possibly for the first time, unless I missed it, about my socialists. And I was very struck by this expression. So I would like to ask, who exactly are Maria Todorova's socialists? Is it all of them? Does Maria Todorova have favorites? And what makes them curse, besides her grandmother in the postcard? Uh, but you can tell us about that. I'm thinking that Maria uh, Todorova might have fondness for a particular archetypal socialist of the pre-World War I period. Someone who read socialist literature and dreamt of utopia while believing in science and being an atheist and a feminist. But is it fair to say that the appeal here is the utopia itself? And of course, Kristen already spoke eloquently about that. Uh, so the, the appeal is the dreaming, the striving, the struggle, the imagining rather than the action and the doing. In other words, the utopia of the future as a goal and as a path, but not the reality of it. As, as you note, utopia on earth ultimately never came to be. And actually I was very struck when you were analyzing Nikola Sakharov, who died in 1943, you actually say, quote, he may have been lucky to have died in 1943 uh, because uh, he opposed the line of the Narrows uh, during and after the 1923 uprising. And basically by dying in 1943, he was able to preserve the dream of utopia for uh, forever. So Maria Todorov in this coda claims to have written, quote, a historical ethnography based on archives and here I'd like to ask you to take the anthropological approach to its fullest and to tell us a little bit more about your positionality vis-a-vis -vis your socialists who live, um, whose lives you have chosen to resurrect for us. Thank you. Thank you. So Maria, I I'm suggesting that you take um, a few of these questions. Um. 
Well, thank you first. And I, I have to begin again with my with my thanks uh, first to Theodora who initiated and uh, organized it. Uh, I mean, I have followed your path as a talented student and then a colleague and, and, and friend, uh, and I think of you as my intellectual daughter. So thank you very much. And, and, and thank you, of course, to Larry, my bosom friend and my intellectual twin who housed me when I put the last uh, uh, you know, uh, strokes on this manuscript at the Remark Institute, uh, which I thought could be, of course, uh, you know, the beginning of, of socialism, but that was you know, before. <laughs> and, and also Ulf, who is the shining and benevolent star in, in German academia of East European studies, and who also uh, was a, a wonderful host uh, for me in, uh, in Regensburg. And of course, the fiery Christine, my comrade in arms, and I don't need to say any more. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, so uh, I mean, I, I've jotted down uh, some notes, and uh, le let me begin uh, with uh, actually uh, Theodora, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the back. Uh, my response to my socialist is very anodyne. Uh, I, I meant the socialists that I'm writing about, uh, my socialists who are in the book. I don't necessarily, first of all, I don't uh, uh, like them all. I like very many of them, but there were some that were not very likable also among them, uh, as is normal in uh, any human uh, uh, thing. Um, uh, so uh, some of them I do identify with, uh, but the, the one thing which I think is transpiring from, from your reading is that these are my socialists and I'm cutting them off as the good socialists, unlike the ones uh, on Utopia on Earth. And I'm explicitly not doing that. Uh, and I've said that a couple of times in the, uh, in, in the book. Uh, so for example, even uh, uh, Sakharov, he, was, uh, he, he himself uh, was part of the narrow party. Blagoev is part of the narrow party and he's against the line. So it is not that Sakharov was against the Narrows. So they were against this militancy and it is a generational thing also. Yes, uh, as I said, some people were disappointed. Some people were, uh, uh, you know, went along, uh, others paid with their life. But uh, let me explain part of the reason that I have uh, that I've been speaking about the socialists uh, until the First World War is A, because they are less known, even in Bulgarian historiography, which has this uh, a kind of a condescending look upon them that were not, not the real uh, you know, types. Secondly, because, uh, because I had to contrast them to a new generation. I really wanted to keep up this generational unit, intellectual generational unit, not necessarily, uh, you know, demographic uh, 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 generation. Because the, the, the next generation is really different because of the different historical context. And I do have, in fact, a database on these people uh, in, in the following period, but it would have been a second book or a huge book in which I would be contrasting uh, all, these, uh, all these people. Um, so, um, your, your, so, so the, the, this, the, this second question about my socialist is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is clear. Um, I don't agree that it is only hope and struggle and striving without movement and doing. The doing is also part of it. Uh, and, and striving is doing. So uh, just sitting back and striving and dreaming is not, is not the thing. All these people were doer, doers. It is not that utopia on earth was the one which was uh, effect, uh, effective and the first one was only affective. They are all doers. So th that's the one point where I would uh, push back. Uh, the other thing about network theory, I, I agree. And I, was, uh, I really was thinking of that, but, but that uh, A, would have uh, expanded the work too much and B, I did not have that much data in, in order to make a, a real uh, you know, um, uh, art, uh, art of the uh, case um, uh, analysis. Uh, you, you need, 
uh, more more data which which you can put in a rigorous analysis uh, uh, for, for for this network uh, thing. Uh, so uh, yes, the the, the the transnational network is fantastic. Uh, I I could play with illustrations, but they will be simply illustrative at this point. Um, so uh, let me now jump uh, just. Uh, uh, to to uh, to um, uh, Ulf's uh, uh, questions. Uh, first, the prosopography. Um, uh, yes, um, I, I agree that it's the mobility rather than the social structure which which identifies these people. That that is absolutely um, uh, correct. Um, it is it is really their mobility within the country and also outside uh, of the country. Um, but your question is then, uh, what makes them uh, socialists? Uh, and uh, you are also linking it to the to the idea uh, of, uh, between socialism and individual uh, life projects. Uh, was it collective utopia or was it individual uh, sub subjectivity? And of course, it is both. The the thing in uh, in the Bulgarian context is that socialism. Uh, be, uh, becomes uh, unlike in other countries uh, where it can become uh, when it comes earlier or in others later in Bulgaria it comes almost from the outset in its Marxist uh, uh, you know uh, vein uh, and the thing that attracts the most is science these all all of these people are completely enamored by a scientific enlightenment scientific view most of them dream to become biologists and teachers in schools. They don't because, uh, by, you know, by biology and teachers in schools, they are, they are uh, of course, apt to be, uh, you know, uh, accused by the church that they are Darwinists and whatnot. And very many of them, as I say, become lawyers because, uh, you know, law is the one profession where they would be untouchable. But, but usually it's, you know, Blagojev goes out to study physics. So they, they are really attracted to, uh, to uh, hard sciences uh, and Marxism for them is uh, the response, you know, the, the rigorous response uh, uh, for, for, uh, for society. Um, now, uh, why do they go to socialism? Yes, it is absolutely contingent. And I have uh, lots of, uh, you, you evoked uh, Dimitar Pandov, uh, other uh, uh, stories where somebody is uh, working in a, uh, he's um, uh, in, in an artisan shop and he's freezing. And the only other uh, person next to him uh, is, uh, is nice to him. And he likes people who are good. And it so happened that this particular person was a socialist. So he goes to the socialist club because it's also warm there, right? And he wants to warm himself up and he listens to these people and he, uh, he's seduced by, uh, by, by all these uh, the talks. Now, uh, does, emotion, uh, uh, does emotion build collectivity? Absolutely. And I'm glad that, uh, that Larry um, evoked uh, the uh, international, uh, you know, uh, it, it is, People are singing together, and I'm showing also some people who are the creators. Georgi uh, Kirkov himself is the uh, lyrical, uh, you know, the, the the poet who creates the um, a march of uh, of labor, and then there is another socialist who does the, uh, the the music. But the famous international, I hate marches. You know, Larry knows that I uh, I love opera, and marches are you know there are some good marches in opera, but in general not. But the international is the one thing which makes me cry. Okay, so I get goosebumps. Uh, it, it is a very powerful uh, thing. So yes, uh, music can make collectivity. Singing together can make collectivity. Uh, and when I say collectivity, I don't mean crowds. So uh, with crowds, I'm actually much more elitist, but, uh, but, but I mean collectivity. So uh, the other question, which is interesting, which which uh, a lot of you have evoked, it's Van de Sienko. And uh, why don't we see frustration, fear? Are they looking for something here as, uh, as, uh, as a kind of security? And I think that not. Uh, the, the ethos of these people, their value system was, uh, was self-discipline, strength, and 
if they have frustrations, they, they, they would be, uh, you know, sublimating them within this thing of doing things. So, so self-discipline is very, very strong uh, within these people. Uh, you, you have glimpses of, of self-doubt uh, in these uh, uh, personal, uh, you know, um, in this uh, sources, but but not overwhelmingly uh, like uh, uh, like not aestheticized. You you have them in uh, outside of the uh, socialist milieu. Of course, this is the time of symbolists and all that. You do have it, but in the socialist milieu, you don't have that. So even if they have the frustrations, they are uh, they are uh, uh, sublimated. Um, um, Transfer and quasi. Yes, I agree. Uh, I mean, I was more critical about transfer because, uh, uh, because you know, uh, because when I when I started this book, I was at the Wissenschaftskolleg and I met uh, Jürgen Kocker who said, oh, so what are you doing? And I told him, oh, so you're doing the transfer of Western ideas in Bulgaria. Ah, <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, uh, but um, uh, but uh, the Istra Croze, I totally agree. It is predicated on, uh, on the, uh, on the national uh, unit, and it also uh, comes with its uh, uh, with its uh, bad baggage. And I agree that it's more a co-production uh, rather than uh, this type of thing. But 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 again, uh, I mean, I would not try to diminish that. Still, uh, in in very many ways, uh, this periphery is a receiver. It does co-produce, but it is in very many ways a receiver. So again, I don't want to go, uh, to go into the other extreme uh, in which I would posit that they are equally, uh, uh, you know, people from there are necessarily equally creative. You know, they are the creators, but the creators are uh, transmitted also within the center. That, that was my point, right? Um, although in some cases, uh, in the case of the Balkan Federation, I'm actually showing that they are the creators and their ideas are then uh, appropriated and given uh, as, as, as their own. Uh, and, uh, and back to, uh, back to uh, Christine's notion of what is significant. I mean, I, I think I have it even in the book, uh, but I, I would uh, actually uh, spell it uh, even here. Uh, you know, significance is fickle. And, and, and my, my, uh, my uh, example is uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, who in 1998, uh, it, it, it was a really funny interview in the uh, Nouvelle Observateur in which he said he revealed that the CIA uh, had coaxed uh, the Russians into invading uh, Afghanistan by, by starting uh, the, this uh, secret operation. And then uh, he was asked whether he would regret uh, that uh, uh, giving support to Islamic fundamentalists, and he responded, and this is what he said, regret what? That secret operation was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Russians into Afghanistan, and you want me to regret it? What is more important in world history, he says? The Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Union? Some agitated Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War? I bet he wouldn't have said that after 9-11. So significance in two years can you know, dramatically, uh, radically change. And, and, and this is what is beautiful also uh, in, uh, in, in history. Uh, yes, uh, significance can change. Um, the question of whether, uh, how, oh, there is forward, forward looking, uh, and backward looking nostalgia. The thing is that these people were also backward looking. I mean, uh, their difference from Marx is a hundred years, just like our difference from them. So they are also going up in the past and they are uh, you know, learning from, uh, uh, from the past. Um, so uh, yes, we are removed from, uh, from this period, but but uh, the the ideas the, the ideas are always uh, there. Now the one thing is that uh, utopia is not necessarily only uh, looking forward. And and the thing of socialist utopia, I'm I'm using the socialist utopia, but socialist utopia was invented 
socialist utopians by Marx, actually by Engels, by, by writing about this socialist who are different from Marxism and he calls them utopians, right? So uh, it is not only the uh, Karl Ma Mannheim thing where he actually looks, uh, he um, divides utopia from ideology. And it is in fact Ernst Bloch, and I'm actually depending very much on Ernst Bloch, who, who is the one who emancipates socialist utopia from the dustbin of history, which the Marxists themself, uh, themselves has, uh, had, had put it back. Um, so uh, can we hope and can we, uh, how can we take back these things? Uh, at my age, I think is, uh, you know, my task is only to show and perhaps to inspire. And since I'm writing about generations, I think that it is, the young generation, all these people are young. These socialists are very, very young. So it is the young people who have to take up this thing and to start dreaming and moving and striving and doing things to reach something which should not be a telos. And this is the main point. Utopia has, has been from the very outset with the Thomas More and, uh, and all that, a kind of telos. Even Marx was saying that communism is not something that we know, it is a movement, but it is a striving for a better world. And how we define a better world uh, is, is uh, really uh, up for grabs. But uh, so utopia is, is, is not uh, in fact uh, um, a monopole only for socialists. Any, any, uh, any ideology, even the right-wing ideologists have their own utopias. So uh, it, it's not utopia necessarily that, uh, that I'm, tr I'm trying to emancipate. It is socialist utopia that I'm trying to emancipate in this case. Uh, so have I responded more or less?